This is Rich Turchell speaking. Some comments from both uh, the public on the line. Um, I think we wanted to get to first start up with any comments that are in the room with uh, public participants. Um, do I see uh, any show of hands with anyone who wanted to make a comment or question on the part of any public participant in the room? Seeing none. With that, uh, Jill, if we can move forward and, and open the lines for individuals to uh, present their comments and questions to uh, to the NRC in this meeting. Phone line, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question at this time, please press star one and be sure to record your name when prompted so that you may be introduced. Star one, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question at this time. Stand by for any comments or questions.
this has been so much like other things. I remember back when the website was being developed, and I said you can't use organic material as packing material in these barrels and drums. And the NRC promised me, and promised me in writing, oh, they'll only use inorganic material, bentonite or, or concrete or something like that. Yeah, they use inorganic material. The waste product of a furniture factory, plywood ground down, and uses packing material in the drums. And you know, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, oh, they promised me this, they promised me that. And then we wound up 40, 50 years later with explosions in the drums in the whip project. I was told that, oh, Mr. Lewis, yes, you won your, the Lewis contention of three mile island number one restart hearings. And yes, we're gonna put a uh, filtered, uh, hardened vent on Three Mile Island number one before restart. And they did, because I was at Global and Gantry here in Philadelphia when they, uh, the truck was loaded, and I had people in Harrisburg that made sure it went on. And that's where it stopped. And to this day, as far as I know, those hardened, filtered vents have not gone on any other nuclear power plants after I won that contention at Three Mile Island number one restart hearings. So I'm wondering about, hey, they're telling me all sorts of wonderful things. How much of those wonderful things are going to fruition? Too bad. Okay, I've been a materials engineer for over 50 years. I, I was 1960, I got my license. I don't know how many years that is. Maybe somebody has better at arithmetic than I. I hope so, because I sure did not see anybody good at arithmetic giving me any data that I could hang my hat on. Okay, thank you for the privilege having my say. I hope it does some good. I doubt it. Thank you. Thanks, Marvin. Um, I really do appreciate your comments. One thing that, as I was listening closely to what uh, you were commenting on, it sounds like you may have, at some point, some safety concerns. And what I'd offer is, and you, you you're probably aware of this, that if you go to NRC's public website at www.nrc.gov, in the upper right-hand corner there's a button, and I think it's a yellow button, that um, is for sending us safety concerns. And I would offer that if you feel that there are safety concerns, please do um, provide those to us. You can do that either through the website or there's a there's a toll-free safety hotline that um, will come up once you um, touch that button on the NRC public website. But I do thank you for your comments. Next question is from Nina Babiar. Your line is open. Well, good morning. This is Nina Babiar is out in San Diego with Public Watchdog. And so I have a comment and also a question. My question the NRC opened this meeting noting that the OPEC request is what prompted it. I'd like to bring into focus a sentence from the OPEC letter that requested this meeting, quote, the urgency of this request is propelled by the need to establish a path forward to resume loading at the songs without delay. The loaded transfer cast stranded in the fuel building is one of several compelling reasons that beckon us for an urgent regulatory engagement. It's our understanding of what prompted this meeting. So my, I'm just astounded that uh, you wouldn't be addressing any of these issues regarding the public safety at San Onofre. And so my question is that the loaded transfer cast 
known to us out here in Southern California as can number 30, has been quote unquote stranded in the fuel handling building for approximately nine months. What action is being taken by the NRC, Southern California Edison, and or Holtec to procure and install a hot cell to mitigate this unprecedented and continued unresolved risk due to Southern California Edison violations of federal law and the NRC design reviews that are impacting our community. And I, I really have to ask also, is it just that you're lowering the criteria to meet the incompetence of a failed design to accommodate and cover the whole tech posterior? Thank you, Nina. Yeah, thank you, Nina. This is Mike Layton again. With regard, with regard to your comments on um, the canister at Southern California Edison, what I would offer is if you would like to reach over to Region 4 office, all of those items that you discussed are all part of the um, inspection items that Region 4 has uh, before them right now. The canister that's on the loading floor and also the restart um, question on whether loading would continue. And like I mentioned at the, uh, the start of this, even though that was mentioned in the letter from uh, Holtec, because these are um, inspection issues that are before the agency now, we're, we're not in a position to comment on those in this meeting, but I would encourage you to reach over to Region 4 
where is the entity that def defends the public interest in this? And the fact that the public has paid for everything, either it's taxpayers or ratepayers, and is relying on it, which is accountable for what it's promised to do. If whole tax system is damaging the canisters, that's a defective system in any engineered system. When you have metal to metal abrasion that wasn't intended, you have a defective system, and that system needs to be recalled. Clearly, we have a defective system here, and the discussion today didn't even talk about the consequences of the scratching and the gouging that we calculated, which absolutely becomes a safety issue as corrosion cracking starts to compromise the integrity of containment. I would like to see the analysis by Holtec of three passes through a defective system, so clearly defective that brand new canisters are being damaged by the system. I'd like to see the analysis that says that's what they intended and this is okay. I think it's outrageous. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, questions from, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. I apologize. No, no. I was, I was simply going to um, comment on, on this, one of Mr. Johnson's uh, comments that the system, uh, OPEC system, needs to be recalled and point out that there is an opportunity for really any person to ask the NRC to take an action. Um, whether it's a licensee or a vendor. And provisions that we have for that are in um, 10 CFR section 2.206. So if you, if you wish to bring that type of um, request or action to the NRC, that would be the process to bring it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from Kate Thank you. Uh, thank you for today's meeting. I do also feel that today it would have helped to have heard a more careful look at the dangers of the Who's this? of the canisters being loaded down into um, the system and make and so that the public is feeling safe um, that that the um, that everyone using the system has a better way of doing it than has done before. Um, so that's one of the things. I'm, I'm wondering if, if I hear about the scratches are a normal thing. Do we have data on any dry storage vertical system with its scratches? And then I guess my last one, and of course I'm certainly not understanding exactly what I'm hearing here, but when you were talking about local stress on the canisters and peak stress, um, it's a passive system uh, so that that would be um, minimum um, problem. But when we think of the world right now in global warming, a temperature change, I can, I'm concerned that, say, if we had a, this system in the desert and for a decade or more, um, two decades, if the temperature goes to, outside temperature goes to 110, does the canister survive that down in the earth? Um, those are just questions that come to my mind that I, I couldn't understand. I, I heard um, sometimes words implied and sometimes the use of the word Alara, and so I, I just would like it as clear as possible so that we all feel safe about the system that's being used. And thank you for listening to all of us. Thank you for your comment. The, the one uh, perhaps question that I have is I am aware of the community engagement panel activities that are associated with um, Southern California songs. And it sounds to me like those are good questions to bring up that venue if you have concerns with those questions. Thank you, sir. 
Mm, hello. Um, I too am curious about the status of canister number 30. Um, I also hope that this, there's a transcript to this meeting because uh, quite a bit of the conversation was not easily understood. Um, <clears throat> I find it odd that Holtec continually references ASME codes, yet they are not ASME N3 pressure vessel certified. So I'm not sure how they can, you know, make references to those codes when ASME is not even involved. <clears throat> um, as far as questions that we ask, I just wonder when we might get some answers. We've sat through quite a few webinars and, and all, and there's over 33 pages of public questions just from the chat rooms. And you posted the questions, but not the answers. So it would, it would be really great if we could get some answers on that. And particularly, considering the risks of chloride stress-induced corrosion and cracking, I'd really like to hear the NRC respond to Donna Gilmore's question related to the risks of um, potential explosion due to the high burn-up level of fuel. So ML18269A037 would be a really good one for the um, NRC to respond to. And I think that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ms. Walker. Um, just for clarity, there is no transcript for this meeting. Many of um, the interactions that we have in Category 1 meetings don't um, do transcripts. We do have um, a summary note that will be posted on this, and it will be in Adams. Um, and I do thank you for pointing out that we do owe Donna Gilmore a response to the stress corrosion cracking question that was uh, put to me personally whenever I was um, talking at the Diablo Canyon Union Basement family. I do owe Donna a response to that, and it will, it will be forthcoming. And Amy, this is uh, Linda Howell. I'd also add we did receive your most recent correspondence and questions to us, and both my team and my team will be on together for you. I think that we, again, this is a whole tech meeting, so I don't want to get into specific details concerning the status of um, still transfer operations at the San Onofre plant. Uh, we have a draft canister number 30. Um, its status has not changed. You are free to contact me if you'd like to know more about that. But I think you raised another question um, early in your comments that we perhaps should turn over to Dr. Anton or Mr. Amin and that had to do with the ASME qualifications for the canister. So if you want to repeat that, um, perhaps they can address that for you. I think she's offline off to her. If I could uh, re remember the question. Walker said uh, the question she had was that Holtec is using ASME codes for pressure vessels for their designs, but yet Holtec isn't ASME code certified. This is the question they can fire. Yeah, that's the Yeah, 
Uh, hello. Thank you. I am a, a filmmaker in San Diego, and I'm just looking deeply into this issue and finding it more and more concerning the more I hear. The, probably the most frustrating thing for me is the fact that the NRC's primary job is to protect public safety. And here we have a situation where hundreds of millions of dollars are being invested into a system that doesn't prepare the waste for transport off our coastline. It's criminal enough that a storage site was approved 108 feet from the Pacific Ocean in what I consider a defective storage system that is consistently downplayed of the long-term risks that we're all facing here. Just as Miss um, Kale had, Miss Walker had mentioned, these you know statements by Holtec seem very frustrating to me when these pressurized vessels don't even have a release valve and they can't be internally monitored. They're not suitable for transport. And here we are putting ourselves into a, a, a predicament, even a worse situation than having just left the fuel in the pools for now until we get the proper canisters to be able to transport this waste and monitor it safely for decades to come. So what's happening right now is that we are using a defective system that's a temporary solution with no foresight and no hot cell on site. So my recommendation to the NRC, and, and please, it, you know, it's, it, it's a waste of energy to ask me to address my concerns with the um, community engagement panel, which, you know, does very little to take action on this issue. They're seemingly just entertaining our concerns and projecting their own propaganda, not to mention that, you know, going to District 4, yes, please, I will submit my answers to the, you know, or my questions to them, and, you know, this is a bigger issue that can require some change in policy so that the NRC does their job of ensuring that public safety is a priority and not the convenience and profitability of corporations, and that's what it feels like is happening and it's not okay. There's way too much at risk, and I, I want a lot more explanation about how, you know, Scott just recently released this video and downplays the risk of what a leak would do or the, or the risk of a hydrogen gas explosion if there was a crack in one of the canisters and oxygen got inside of it or water got inside of it. What's going to happen and how are you going to handle it? There's no backup plan here. There's no defense in depth. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I really hope that you guys find a way to require thick walled casts that can be monitored, inspected, um, and transported, and also a hot cell so that we have a backup plan. If anything does go wrong, we have a way of mitigating the situation before it's literally too late. So thank you for taking my comment. Thank you, Mr. Van Evers. Um, Again, I'll refer you that if you you have the opportunity that you can ask NRC to take action um, along any lines that you talked about, and the provisions for that are in our regulations in 10 CFR section 2.206. So if you do wish to avail yourself of that, that would be the proper process for that. Um, I would like to comment on one of your um, statements where you said that the cast cannot be transported. The design for this certificate, the um, ISO and UMAX, is approved for both storage and transport. So at, at some point as a location becomes available, whether it's a um, another centralized infant storage facility or whether it's um, final disposition of some repository, those canisters can be transported. 
Thank you. Donna Gilmore, your line is open. Um, Michael, um, yeah, this is Donna Gilmore. Um, I had asked you at the Diablo meeting, um, it did, did your staff know that there would be metal-to-metal -metal contact at the precision, that the system Holtec is using is not a preci precision downloading system? Did you uh, find the answer to that question? I think it was presented here, yes. So you so you knew about this before the uh, the UMAC system was approved. Are you talking about me personally or the agency? I am talking about who whoever approved, um, not you personally, but whoever approved the COC. Uh, did they know that there was going to be metal to metal contact because it's a and not a precision loading system? So I'm not quite sure <coughs> Yeah, at a time that the VE again this was the base and the information that was presented uh, in the um, in the safety analysis report in the in the tech spec and uh, <coughs> uh for this, you know, particular design uh, in the SAR, there was, uh, as uh, Stefan presented, <coughs> there was a statement that they did not anticipate any um, sort of scratches. Um, however, in the you know, other systems that, that we have approved, you know, we have considered, you know, scratches and. Um, uh, I mean, there hasn't been any, um, you know, safety concern. But I think uh, in this case that the whole tech is planning, or they have done 7248 to revise that part of the, you know, SR. And, of course, as in during our inspection, we will look at that 7248 and we will look at the technical basis for that. Okay, so what I what I heard is that at, at the time it was, it was a, the UMAX was approved for Holtec uh, because of the information provided by Holtec um, about there would be no metal to metal contact uh, that you assume they would have a way to prevent that with their loading system. So since we now know that is not the case, this is obviously a safety issue. Um, and there should be a license amendment. I think the NRC has excellent staff, but it's time for their management to be brave enough to take on Holtec and whoever the politics are that, that is giving him such influence and let your staff do their job, Michael, and do a license amendment and let's just get everything on the table. I've worked in government before. I know how it is to feel when you have a boss that's not going to back you up to do the right thing. And you got you know well I got on well this is going to be pit corrosion cracking it's going to be um, crevice corrosion cracking you're going to have crack growth rate these canisters are 200 300 degrees Celsius according to Tom Pomisano Tom you know I you, you're not you don't have to speak but you have multiple times told me these are 200 to 300 degrees Celsius that means the crack growth rate is going to even be faster than the 16 years uh, that the NRC told me it would be back in 2014. Uh, when you're talking cooler canister. So let's get real here. Forget trying to send this to somebody else. Don't send it to Region 4. It's not the inspection issue. Don't send it to some petition. This is your responsibility as a design division chief or manager, whatever, to, to, to be responsible that you ended up approving something where you were given misinformation, so they need to do a license amendment to fix this. Um, and, you know, the, these whole tech systems are crap. These are lemons, the above ground systems. I researched those since finding this out. They lack precision. You got carbon channels scraping the entire sides of the canisters in the above ground whole tech systems. And now you're going to be okay with putting this in New Mexico, too? Let's get real here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Donna, for your comments, as always. <laughs> I would like to encourage you that some of your statements 
uh, indicate that you feel that um, NRC's management is providing undue influence over NRC staff technical reviews. And what I would ask you to do is, again, go to the webpage at www.nrc.gov. And if you feel strongly about that being a safety issue, please send it in to reporting a safety issue with NRC. And be specific, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for um, creating this meeting today that the public could be involved with. I have to, I have to echo and reiterate what Donna Gilmore is saying, and also what Kayleen Walker is saying. And what is very interesting, after being late in the public comments right now, is that it's really obvious that there is a common thread running amongst everyone that's calling in. And, and we're being told, well, go to this website, or even more frustratingly and scarily, being, saying, go, looking at whole text as the expert because they've created these. And yet they're not addressing safety issues. They're addressing the operational nature, how it's loaded, but nothing to do with the safety issues of the canister that they're creating. I have uh, the same question stated slightly differently that everybody else had. How do you account for the environmental stress like a salty, moist, sandy environment that accelerates corrosion even with minor scratches over a period of time? And that is, I have not heard those words or anything even alluded to at a CEP meeting, by the way, I live in San Clemente, California. At a CEP meeting, we are basic, it's basically a cosmetic tool by SCE just so that there's somewhere where our, our, our concerns can be listened to, but nothing is done about it. And I have to tell you, when you are us, Michael, sitting here, and hearing you say, well, go over to the website at NEC and go over to the left corner and click here and then be sure that you're very specific and be sure that you write it all down, which Donna Gilmore has already done and hasn't gotten an answer. Please do not be condescending to us anymore. I have gone to several meetings now and I've become very concerned about this because it is just a hot potato that's passed. How about somebody, as Donna mentioned, be brave, do the right thing, and address the safety issues of these canisters to explain away these scratches when there's already proof out there and data that shows, yes, even minor scratches can have the corrosion accelerated in a marine environment. That, uh, that is apparent. And also, as I read on the website and went deeper and deeper, the whole tech meetings that are being held across the United States, excuse my naivete, but oh my, it's not just the situation here. This problem is prevalent. You've got a lemon here. Deal with it. Change it. There's $5 billion to take care of this issue. Perhaps a lot of it's spent now. Do the right thing. And I rest my case. <laughs> Now, this is Mike Layton, and I, I apologize if I appeared to be um, condescending when I try to direct uh, your concerns or comments either to our allegation program or um, petitions to the NRC. I offer those because those are truly the paths for public to put their concerns forward for the agency action, whether it's um, going to that little button in the right side of, or upper, left, upper right corner of the web page, that puts you in direct contact with our allegations program. And the NRC's allegations program is, takes these things very seriously. And if you do go there and read through what, what is comes up as you um, talk about that for, as the screen comes up and tells you what the allegations program is. 
I'm encouraging you, if you do have the concerns, please bring them forward in that in that venue because they, we, they will get addressed. Similarly, with putting petitions forward under 10 CFR 2.206, those requests do get addressed. So I, I apologize if I sounded condescending, but I'm trying to be helpful in guiding you to the processes that we have that will result in action. Thank you. If you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please press star 1 and record your name to be introduced. Our next question or comment from Rob Hi, this is Rob Nicoleski from the City of Union Tribune. And I'm just hearing myself uh, on the, uh, hang on a second. Yeah, one of my questions would be uh, with, uh, uh, in regards to Mr. Layton, could you tell us a little bit more uh, at the very end of the presentation before you took the public comment, you were talking about um, uh, the fact that uh, Home Tech can make the changes to the FS or, or, the, or to the FR uh, and that uh, they might be under uh, review by inspection from the NRC. Could you give a little bit more detail? Then I have a follow-up after that. Oh, certainly. What what you're referring to is what's outlined in our regulations under 10 CFR 702.48. Um, and this, this is a provision, and it, it's not unique to the Part 72, which covers whole type of it's also in uh, many other regulatory requirements in, in a similar fashion, even with the uh, power reactors. And it allows a licensee, or in this case, um, a design authority, which is Holtec, to make certain uh, changes to not the technical specifications to the design, but to the um, final or the uh, final safety analysis report that was submitted as part of the licensing basis for the certificate. And if you go and look at the um, provisions in 72.48, they're very um, prescriptive in a screening process, so to speak, as to identifying when it's appropriate for the design authority to make those changes and when it would not be, uh, or I should say, if, if, if the screening doesn't, if the design authority can't go through all of the eight criteria for the screening, then the decision is that that um, change needs to come into NRC as a license amendment. So I hope that clarifies it a bit. that I've heard for about the last two hours. Uh, there was a gentleman, the first gentleman who presented the bulk of the slides, who talked about metal fatigue and uh, whether or not stainless steel is ductile. I didn't pick up, I thought stainless steel was not ductile, but I didn't pick up what he said. Now, metal fatigue is a problem, of course, but the fogging or the ignoring the fact that these canisters will be subjected to bombard uh, radiation bombardment, which has to be added to the metal fatigue and will cause embrittlement of metal. Um, embrittlement is ignored at Palisades, and in Japan there were there are there are uh, reactors that were not started but up again because. They already knew they were too brittle to start up. And yet, we talk about these physical processes that don't involve atomic radiation. And um, I, uh, I'm really amazed that you can, if, pardon the expression, get away with talking about uh, the fatigue of materials. 
without adding in the fact that these materials are going to be bombarded by radiation over a period of many decades. That's my comment. Hi, this is John Wise, um, Materials Engineer at the NRC. Um, just to clarify, um, the effect of fatigue and the radiation effects on materials is a big part of our materials review of all of our storage systems that we approve, and this includes the high form units. So as a matter of course, when uh, our materials engineers, we have several look at the certificates like the UMAC certificate. We look at the specific materials they propose to use, and we evaluate um, those against the environments to which they're exposed. This includes the effect of radiation and potential embrittlement of certain materials. And it also includes <clears throat> how these materials behave um, as they go through the, um, the cyclic temperature flux fluctuations that have been discussed here a few times today. <clears throat> We've uh, heard a few people bring up the, the night day or the, the heat of the day temperature fluctuations. Those are all part of um, <clears throat> our review as materials reviewers. And um, an actual, actually the uh, ASME code also forces the uh, designer to go through a process to evaluate the fatigue behavior of the material. Without additional damage, once once they've been sitting at the reactor site for how many years? So how many years are they expected to not become too embrittled over? How many years are they expected to, to sit and, and wait? And I was going to ask, what is the temperature difference between the bottom and the top of the cask at, at the peak of the day and the, and the end of the day? But uh, obviously you've taken some of that into account, but it would be kind of nice if you had those kinds of numbers uh, available to us. And regarding the scratching on the way in of 30, uh, is it possible that the reason it was scratched was not because they had not positioned it properly over the canister, over the hole as best they could tell, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't standing perfectly vertically because it wasn't loaded perfectly uh, balanced. Some of the, uh, would there have been some way that the internal uh, air, uh, material inside the canister has become unbalanced? That's uh, what I'm trying to ask about that. Okay, that's all I've got. Thank you very much for taking my question. Oh, uh, one more thing. Is, are you assuming that the uh, construction of the canister is proper? Because there's approximately, uh, wait, not right now, 10,000 canisters. Are you assuming that every one of them is properly constructed? Uh, because that's what I'm going to do. Or are you giving us the result of what you think is the worst case construction effort uh, of all those 10,000 cans? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Hoffman. NRC. Um, I guess uh, going back to your question, comments basically. Um, the the transfer. I guess I start from the uh, you know uh, the last comment or question that you had. Uh, uh, do all these canisters are you know fabricated you know the same? And uh, I mean we have a sort of an inspection program as part of the inspection program. Actually, we go and we'll look at the you know, fabrication process and all these fabrication are done according to the designs that, that we've approved with the tolerances, with the material. So, <clears throat> uh, so the, the inspection program actually, you know, provides uh, that assurance that uh, these canisters are fabricated uh, uh, according, you know, to the design specification that we have uh, approved. Uh, then the second comment was, uh, oh, could it be on balance as, as it was stored? Uh, I think in generally, I mean, these guys say it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, on balance. Uh, of course, you know, when you, you know, load these 
um, canister, 32, 36 assemblies, um, you know, with all the shams in there, you know, they are not, <coughs> the weight is not perfectly distributed, but the hoisting of it, it generally is balanced, but it's the nature of operation as you lower it, because as it was explained, there is a type tolerance because of the seismic restraint, the actual seismic restraint and the shield ring that the, it would, you know, touch, uh, do, uh, you know, those materials, the, uh, you know, nature of the operation. And then your um, uh, first tumble, miles of... Three miles could be traveled after the long storm. Uh, yeah, and and actually, uh, when uh, they are in storage after the, the, they are in storage, if they're going to be transported, they have to meet the uh, transport certificate of compliance, whatever uh, overpack they are using. That means the canister condition has to comply with the um, requirement, provided what kind of the safety function that canister uh, is performing for transport. So in, in, uh, in most of the cases, you know, the main safety function that is relied upon is the overpack that providing the containment. Uh, and in some cases, if the canister is relied on in terms of providing a water barrier as a secondary barrier, they have to meet the certificate of compliance uh, uh, conditions. So uh, the COC, you know, transport, actually there are uh, those conditions in there, and the, the shipper in this case, um, has to uh, make sure that the, the canister they're shipping it meets all the transport COC conditions. So I think we have time for one more comment or question. Hedrick, your line is open. Hi, this is Gary Hedrick with San Clemente Green here at San Onofre. Um, I just wanted to add a few comments to some things that were already said and also um, relay a story that I think is relevant. Um, the photos that we saw of the downloaded canister, it's obvious that the paint has been scraped off. And so the assumption should be made that this similar metal to metal contact is inevitable. It sounded like you're considering further inspection, but I think we can assume that. Um, another comment or two that I agree with wholeheartedly is that we have to have a contingency plan. Uh, so we already know that their temporary storage of uh, cancer number 30 is in question. Uh, it's probably been there too long, and it's because we don't have a proper solution to this situation. So that, I think, is a big responsibility of the NRC. And my next comment about the NRC and your, you know, what what areas of jurisdiction you have kind of reminds me of a story I heard back, uh, not a story, it's what I witnessed at a CEP meeting where uh, the CEO of Holtec, Chris Singh, was being asked very respectfully by a member of the community um, about an incident involving the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, and uh, charges of bribery from Holtec, and that uh, there was some fine of uh, $2 million, and then they paid that, and then soon after that, uh, they were barred from continuing to do business for three months, and then they landed a $30 million contract after that. But when she brought that up in the meeting, Chris Singh just tore into her. She, she was so, you know, irate that someone would challenge her reputation like that in public and be so irresponsible, you know, just being, you know, reckless with this, you know, these accusations. And then she came back with the, the actual documents from the TVA, and as a, it was an administrative fee, not a fine, but there has been no such administrative fees in the past. And it was for bribery. And now the, their Canadian partner, SNC Lavalin, they're currently under indictment also for bribery. So it appears like we're working with crooks and criminals, if you just want to be blunt. And I just wonder what the role of the NRC is in this situation. Do you look into the integrity of these people you're working with? Is that even relevant or is that someone else's concern? That's it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Hendricks. 
we do look into allegations of those types of things that you did mention. And as you talk about the partner with uh, Holtec, that really is focusing on a licensing action or a licensing transfer that's before the NRC right now. So those are things that do get examined and do come into consideration when we look at a license transfer for, for material. So with that, we have run a little bit longer than normal. I did want to give the uh, callers ample time to give us comments and, and give us an opportunity to respond as best we can. I do thank everyone that called in for their um, their patience and also the, the good quality comments and good decorum that you expressed with, with giving those comments. I want to thank Holtec for taking the time to present their information to us here at LC. And with that, Mike, thank you. I, I did, again, this is Rich Turtell, and I do request if you do want to be part of the attendee list, uh, please send me an email with a short, a short little title that says include me in the attendee list. And I've reached out to really many, many of you with the information for this meeting. So just shoot an email back to me. I greatly appreciate that. You'll be on the record. You have your can you speak the email? Uh, yes, my my email is Richard R I C H A R D dot Turtel T as in Tom U R T as in Tom I L at N R C dot gov. So thank you, Jill, for moderating for us. And with that, this uh, public meeting is is completed. Thank and you. Today's conference call. We thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect. Great rest of your day.